As for current projects, I've got a couple things on the burner that right now involve access I have that, you know, if I, if I told you about the projects, they would actually compromise the people who've given me access to the information. Um, I did last year, uh, Revolution Studios, the guys that made the Hellboy films, sold a bunch of Hellboy props on eBay. And I bought some of them. They're pretty amazing. Um, one of them is, if you remember in the beginning of Hellboy, uh, Ilsa in the museum pulls out a, a thing called an ossuary full of uh, salt. And she pours it out on the ground. And Samael, the, first, the villain in Hellboy, the first movie, gets born from this. Um, I managed to buy that ossuary on eBay. And when I later met uh, Michael Lindsay, the prop master from Hellboy, I talked to him on the phone. He told me that that piece, it's amazing, um, that he was in Prague and he was talking to the conservators at the Jewish Museum and they ended up making that ossuary for the film based on the type of history that was given to them about how this ossuary you know, would have fit into a chronological history for Hellboy. Um, so they made, they designed it and they made it for the film. There's only one of them. And I think I paid like maybe 350 bucks for it. It's a magnificent object. I also purchased, for real money, uh, uh, Broom's Box, uh, which is um, in the same movie in Hellboy, in the museum scene, Abe Sapien opens up this box and pulls out books and there's all these trinkets in it and he looks up the information about Samael. That specific box from that scene is, sits in my office at home. And... Um, it's great to go home every single day. It's right across the way from the R2-D2 and the C-3PO. Um, there is one more thing that I'm working on, which again, I can't talk about right now. However, if everything goes well, I might be wearing it at Comic-Con this year. I might walk the floor in this new costume I'm working on at Comic-Con. And I, I promise you'll hear about it then. Who asked that question? What's that? Who asked that uh, Oh, who asked that question? J-A-V-B-W. Javbua? Javbua. All right. Um, that talk about obsession, I'm really glad there's a question about that talk about obsession. That's actually a, um, I got asked to do a thing called a quickie at IDEO here in San Francisco. Uh, they asked me to get up and talk about a serious play. And I couldn't think of what to talk about. And I decided to talk about this thing that I was working on, the Maltese Falcon. And the talk went over really, really well, a lot better than I thought it would, and people found it really personal. And in fact, Kevin Kelly, uh, who's a friend of mine, came up and said he thought it was a really excellent talk and that I should develop it, I should build it into something. And so over the, over the following eight months, uh, I did that talk at the Hope Conference in New York in July, I did it at Café du Nord back in, in April, uh, I did it at the Amazing Meeting in Las Vegas in July and, or in June, and then I, I, the talk that is up there on Fora TV, I did at the EG conference in Monterey in December. And I've never, I've never, I'm much more off the cuff when Jamie and I go out and do public speaking engagements. We talk about the show. We, we have a way to talk about it that works for us, but it's very much off the cuff. I have, uh, that's the first time I've ever taken a singular concept and really, really worked it and developed it with slides, with a presentation and with a pattern that, that, that had a real flow and also was deeply personal. And I'm really, really proud of that talk. So I'm glad somebody asked about it. Um, number 10. Do you think that the internet has increased or decreased the number of urban myths that people believe? Jack 47. Oh, it has by far increased them. Um, I mean, just search, oh God, it's so much fun to go on YouTube and search terrible driver as a search term or horrible accident. Um, there's so much for us to test, whether, you know, it seems like it's faked or there's a picture of a crane that's gone halfway through an overpass. Could you really drive a crane on a flatbed fast enough to send it halfway through an overpass somewhere in the Midwest? It's still on our list. Um, it's not only increased the number of urban legends, but it's increased, it's increased the, the, the speed at which they spread. Absolutely. Because, I mean, actually one of the earlier myths we did, which was on cell phone destroys gas station, we were actually able to trace the origin of that myth back to an email exchange between somebody uh, who, whose sister uh, caught fire at a gas station from, well, what turned out to be static electricity, a discussion she had on email with um, a representative of the American Petroleum Institute who told her that he thought it was not 
uh, her cell phone. Um, and yet his email got construed to mean the opposite and spread throughout. And by the time we got, by the time we got a hold of it, I mean, it had passed around the world a dozen times. Um, that was only probably two years later. So yeah, I think not only has it increased the number of urban legends and stuff out there that we could test, but it also totally increases the speed, which is awesome for us because there's just every day something happens. I mean, someone just emailed me this morning. Hold on. Someone emailed me a great story this morning. Myth to test. Where is it? Um, let's see here. No, wait. Sorry. It was on my Twitter feed. Here we go. At replies. Someone says... Wait, wait, wait. This is a complete duct tape suit jacket. Isn't this great watching me read my email in real time? <laughs> oh, world's biggest diamond heist. Yeah. So on my Twitter feed, uh, Dr. Findlay says, oh, world's biggest diamond heist. You guys could test this. I totally, I'm going to read this whole article. It's like, absolutely, this seems like, I, we love the heist stuff. Uh, we get a ton of feedback from people. So yeah, there's an endless number of, uh, of good stories out there, especially actually, you know, I'm sure I'll get this more than once. Good stories tend to, you know, get people emailing us. They go to the forums. They send them to me and Jamie and to our friends. Um, we're never going to run out of shit. How do you feel about Snopes? What's that? How do you feel about Snopes? Snopes is great. Um, we've we've used Snopes as a resource a ton. Uh, same with the Straight Dope. Um, Snopes is, uh, I like Snopes' willingness to, uh, to change, change their ideas based on new data, um, and they'll describe the progression that was formerly thought to be false, now we realize it's true, or vice versa. Um, I wish they'd mention us more. I think that some of our research would actually, has actually had a real effect on uh, the truth or falsity of some of the stuff they do, but um, I recognize that we're also technically in the same business, and I guess technically we're competition, so I don't take it personally. Um, it was uh, Cecil at the Straight Dope actually did quote us for one of the stories we did. I can't remember which one it was, but I remember being like, oh, proud. <laughs> Have you ever met uh, the Snopes or Cecil or any of those people? No, uh, no, I haven't met any of the guys from Snopes, any of the guys from Straight Dope or Jan Michael Brunsfeld, one of the uh, sort of the progenitor of urban legend research. Um, I mean, uh, one of the things for us is I, we joke that no one's ever really emailed us and thanked us for all the groundbreaking work we're doing in urban legend research. Um, it's generally understood that urban legends happen to be this fantastic scarecrow on which we can hang a show that's about building stuff. And uh, sci science is peripheral to it simply because the best way to figure something out happens to be the scientific method. And what you've got is a couple guys, me and Jamie, who are actually curious about what the, what the right answer is. So the process by which we figure that out, overlapping our various ignorances and arguments in order to get to a conclusion is roughly, you know, a, a reasonable depiction of how the scientific method actually works in the field. It's messy, it's confusing, it's hard to figure out sometimes just what question you're going to answer. I mean, I check Reddit literally like 30, 30 times a day. It's on my list, you know, it's uh, at the top of my bar. It's, it's, uh, it's Twitter, boing boing, Reddit, dig, slash dot, grow a brain, consumerist, Y Combinator, PowerPage, FARC, Gizmodo and Gadget, Craigslist, eBay, and then Metafilter Replica Props Forum. <laughs> That's my like, go right across there probably 15 times a day. Um, ah, wow. I mean, I guess my only question is, I wonder if people who are posting to Reddit have ulcers because everyone just seems so angry all the time. <laughs> um, no, I don't have any questions. Well, I have a question. Uh, you did a you did an episode where you busted a series of ninja myths. Yeah, which I've always thought was a lot of BS. Have you ever worried about ninjas coming and retaliating? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, I'm not. It, if you wanted to talk about uh, if you wanted to talk about real ninjas, the line of ninjas died out in like the 18th century. So I might as well be afraid of like Minutemen from the Revolutionary War getting pissed off about me saying they couldn't possibly be ready in a minute and coming to shoot me. I think you're causing yourself more problems than you're prepared for. <laughs> <laughs> um, so no, I, I'm not worried about the, about the ninjas. We did have, um, we got a lot of flack the first time we busted arrow catching on the show. 
Um, and we did get contacted by a guy who held the world's record for catching arrows, Anthony Kelly. So we brought him on the show. Um, he was he was great. He actually showed us what he could do, and then we went past that. So we considered that for all the complaints we got that the people said, oh, there's a world record holder in catching arrows. Well, we brought him on, and we showed that he still can't catch an arrow from behind him. You know, um, so I, that was actually a terrific interaction. I'm not afraid of ninjas. The Aska Ninjas guys were here, and they, they just showed up one day. I mean, just like we turned around, and they were right there behind us. And then they left again. That was a nice little... Nice little interaction. Smoke. Yeah, it's a <laughs> poof. QGYH2.